Viaje al centro de la Tierra. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth. Capítulo 1. Chapter 1. The Professor and His Family. El domingo 24 de mayo de 1863. Mi tío, el profesor Lidenrock, regresó precipitadamente a su casa, situada en el número 19 de la Königstrasse, una de las calles más antiguas del barrio viejo de Hamburgo. On the 24th of May 1863, my uncle, Professor Lidenbrock, rushed into his little house, no, 19 Kistras, one of the oldest streets in the oldest portion of the city of Hamburg. Martha must have concluded that she was very much behind hand, for the dinner had only just been put into the oven. Marta, su excelente criada, se azaró de un modo extraordinario, creyendo que se había retrasado, pues apenas si empezaba a cocer la comida en el hornillo. Well, now, said I to myself, if that most impatient of men is hungry, what a disturbance he will make. Bueno, pensé para mí, si mi tío viene con hambre, se va a armar la de San Quintín porque dificulto que haya un hombre de menos paciencia. Am leaving Brock so soon, cried poor Martha in great alarm. Half opening the dining room door. Tan temprano y ya está aquí el señor Lidenrock exclamó la pobre Marta, llena de estupefacción, entreabriendo la puerta del comedor. Yes, Martha, but very likely the dinner is not half cooked, for it is not too yet. St. Michael's clock has only just struck half past one. Sí, Marta, pero tú no tienes la culpa de que la comida no esté lista todavía, porque aún no son las dos. Acaba de dar la media en San Miguel. Then why has the master come home so soon? ¿Y por qué ha venido tan pronto el señor Lidenrock? Perhaps he will tell us that himself. Él nos lo explicará, probablemente. Here he is, Monsieur Axel. I will run and hide myself while you argue with him. Yo me escapo, señor Axel. Hágale entrar en razón. And Martha retreated in safety into her own dominions. Y la excelente Martha se marchó pesurosa a su laboratorio culinario, quedándome yo solo. I was left alone, but how was it possible for a man of my undecided turn of mind to argue successfully with so irascible a person as the professor? Pero, como mi carácter tímido no es el más a propósito para hacer entrar en razón al más irascible de todos los catedráticos, me disponía a retirarme prudentemente a la pequeña habitación del piso alto que me servía de dormitorio, cuando giro sobre sus goznes la puerta de la calle, crujió la escalera de madera bajo el peso de sus pies fenomenales, y el dueño de la casa atravesó el comedor, entrando presuroso en su despacho, colocando, al pasar, el pesado bastón en un rincón, arrojando el mal cepillado sombrero encima de la mesa, y diciéndome con tono imperioso. With this persuasion I was hurrying away to my own little retreat upstairs, when the street door creaked upon its hinges, heavy feet made the whole flight upstairs to shake, and the master of the house, passing rapidly through the dining room, threw himself in haste into his own sanctum. But on his rapid way he had found time to fling his hazel stick into a corner, his rough broad brim upon the table, and these few emphatic words at his nephew. Pegasus. Axel, follow me. No había tenido aún tiempo material de moverme, cuando me gritó el profesor con acento descompuesto. Pero, ¿qué haces que no estás aquí ya? I had scarcely had time to move when the professor was again shouting after me, what, not come yet? Y me precipité en el despacho de mi irascible maestro. And I rushed into my redoubtable master's study. Otto Lidenrock no es mala persona. Lo confieso ingenuamente. Pero, como no cambié mucho, lo cual creo improbable, morirá siendo el más original e impaciente de los hombres. Otto Lidenrock had no mischief in him. I willingly allow that. But unless he very considerably changes as he grows older, at the end he will be a most original character. Era profesor del Juan Naun, donde explicaba la cátedra de mineralogía, enfureciéndose, por regla general, una o dos veces en cada clase. He was professor at the Johannem, and was delivering a series of lectures on mineralogy, in the course of every one of which he broke into a passion once or twice at least. Y no porque le preocupase el deseo de tener discípulos aplicados, ni el grado de atención que estos prestasen a sus explicaciones, ni el éxito que como consecuencia de ella pudiesen obtener en sus estudios, semejantes detalles le tenían sin cuidado. Not at all that he was over anxious about the improvement of his class, or about the degree of attention with which they listened to him, or the success which might eventually crown his labors. Such little matters of detail never troubled him much. Enseñaba subjuntivamente, según una expresión de la filosofía alemana, enseñaba para él, y no para los otros. 
His teaching was as the German philosophy calls it, subjective, it was to benefit himself, not others. He was a learned egotist. Era un sabio egoísta, un pozo de ciencia cuya polea rechinaba cuando de él se quería sacar algo. He was a well of science, and the pulleys worked uneasily when you wanted to draw anything out of it. Era, en una palabra, un avaro. In a word, he was a learned miser. En Alemania hay algunos profesores de este género. Germany has not a few professors of this sort. Mi tío no gozaba, por desgracia, de una gran facilidad de palabra, por lo menos cuando se expresaba en público, lo cual, para un orador, constituye un defecto lamentable. To his misfortune, my uncle was not gifted with a sufficiently rapid utterance, not to be sure, when he was talking at home, but certainly in his public delivery, this is a want much to be deplored in a speaker. En sus explicaciones en el Juan Nagón, se detenía a lo mejor luchando con un recalcitrante vocablo que no quería salir de sus labios, con una de esas palabras que se resisten, se hinchan y acaban por ser expelidas bajo la forma de un taco, siendo este el origen de su cólera. The fact is that during the course of his lectures at the Johannem, the professor often came to a complete standstill. He fought with willful words that refused to pass his struggling lips, such words as resist and distend the cheeks, and at last break out into the unasked for shape of a round and most unscientific oath, then his fury would gradually abate. Hay en mineralogía muchas denominaciones, semigliegas, semilatinas, difíciles de pronunciar, nombres rudos que desollarían los labios de un poeta. Now in mineralogy there are many half Greek and half Latin terms, very hard to articulate, and which would be most trying to a poet's measures. No quiero hablar ahora de esta ciencia, lejos de mi profanación semejante. I don't wish to say a word against so respectable a science, far be that for me. Pero cuando se trata de las cristalizaciones rombodricas, de las resinas retinas fálticas, de las selenitas, de las tungstitas, de los molidatos de plomo, de los tunsatatos de magnesio y de los titanatos de circonio, bien se puede perdonar a la lengua más expedita que tropiece y se haga un lío. True, in the august presence of rhombohedral crystals, retin asphaltic resins, gelinates, facates, molodonites, tungstates of manganese, and titanate of zirconium, Why, the most facile of tongues may make a slip now and then. En la ciudad era conocido de todos este bien disculpable defecto de mi tío, que muchos desahogados aprovechaban para burlarse de él, cosa que le exasperaba en extremo, y su furor era causa de que arreciasen las risas, lo cual es de muy mal gusto hasta en la misma Alemania. It therefore happened that this venial fault of my uncle's came to be pretty well understood in time. And an unfair advantage was taken of it, the students laid wait for him in dangerous places, and when he began to stumble, loud was the laughter, which is not in good taste, not even in Germans. Y si bien es muy cierto que contaba siempre con gran número de oyentes en su aula, no lo es menos que la mayoría de ellos iban solo a divertirse a costa del catedrático. And if there was always a full audience to honor the leading raw courses, I should be sorry to conjecture how many came to make merry at my uncle's expense. Como quiera que sea, no me cansaré de repetir que mi tío era un verdadero sabio. Nevertheless, my good uncle was a man of deep learning, a fact I am most anxious to assert and reassert. Aun cuando rompía muchas veces las muestras de minerales por tratarlos sin el debido cuidado, humía al genio del geólogo la perspicacia del mineralogista. Sometimes he might irretrievably injure a specimen by his too great ardor in handling it, but still he united the genius of a true geologist with the keen eye of the mineralogist. Con el martillo, el punzón, la brújula, el soplete y el frasco de ácido nítrico en las manos, no tenía rival. Armed with his hammer, his steel pointer, his magnetic needles, his blowpipe, and his bottle of nitric acid, he was a powerful man of science. Por su modo de romperse, su aspecto y su dureza, por su fusibilidad y sonido, por su olor y su sabor, clasificaba sin titubear un mineral cualquiera entre las seiscientas especies con que en la actualidad cuenta la ciencia. He would refer any mineral to its proper place among the 601 elementary substances now enumerated, by its fracture, its appearance, its hardness, its fusibility, its sonorousness, its smell, and its taste. Por eso el nombre de Lidenroco gozaba de gran predicamento en los gimnasios y asociaciones nacionales. The name of Lidenbrock was honorably mentioned in colleges and learned societies. Un brigabi, de un volt y los capitanes Franklin y Sabine no dejaban de visitarle a su paso por Hamburgo. 
Humphrey Davy, to Humboldt, Captain Sir John Franklin, General Sabine, never failed to call upon him on their way through Hamburg. Pequerel, Ebegmen, Beister, Dumas y Milnegor solían consultarle las cuestiones más palpitantes de la química. Esta ciencia le era dodora de magníficos descubrimientos, y, en 1853, había aparecido en Leipzig un tratado de cristalografía trascendental por el profesor Otto Lidenbrock, obra en folio, ilustrada con numerosos grabados, que no llegó, sin embargo, a cubrir los gastos de su impresión. Becquerel, Bellman, Brewster, Dumas, Mill Edwards, St. Clair de Ville frequently consulted him upon the most difficult problems in chemistry, a science which was indebted to him for considerable discoveries, for in 1853 there had appeared at Leipzig an imposing folio by Otto Lidenbrock, entitled A Treatise upon Transcendental Chemistry, with plates, a work, however, which failed to cover its expenses. Además de lo dicho era mi tío conservador del Museo Mineralógico del señor Strube, embajador de Rusia, preciosa colección que gozaba de merecida y justa fama en Europa. To all these titles Donner let me add that my uncle was the curator of the Museum of Mineralogy formed by M. Struve, the Russian ambassador, a most valuable collection, the fame of which is European. Tal era el personaje que con tanta impaciencia me llamaba. Such was the gentleman who addressed me in that impetuous manner. Y afina es un hombre alto, delgado, con una salud de hierro y un aspecto juvenil que le hacía aparentar diez años menos de los cincuenta que contaba. Fancy a tall, spare man, of an iron constitution, and with a fair complexion which took off a good ten years from the fifty he must own to. His restless eyes were in incessant motion behind his full-sized spectacles. Sus grandes ojos giraban sin cesar detrás de sus amplias gafas. Su larga y afilada nariz parecía una lámina de acero. Los que le perseguían con sus burlas decían que estaba imanada y que atraía las limaduras de hierro. His long, thin nose was like a knife blade. Boys have been heard to remark that that organ was magnetist and attracted iron filings. Alumnia vil, sin embargo, pues solo atraía al tabaco, aunque en gran abundancia. Dicho sea en honor de la verdad. But this was merely a mischievous report. It had no attraction except for snuff, which it seemed to draw to itself in great quantities. Cuando haya dicho que mi tío caminaba a pasos matemáticamente iguales, que medía cada uno media toisa de longitud, y añadido que siempre lo hacía con los puños sólidamente apretados, señal de su impetuoso carácter, lo conocerá lo bastante el lector para no desear su compañía. When I have added, to complete my portrait, that my uncle walked by mathematical strides of a yard and a half, and that in walking he kept his fists firmly closed, sure sign of an irritable temperament, I think I shall have said enough to dissentient any one who should by mistake have coveted much of his company. Vía en su modesta casita de conigestrase, en cuya construcción entraban por partes iguales la madera y el ladrillo, y quedaba uno de esos canales tortuosos que cruzan el barrio más antiguo de Hamburgo, felizmente respetado por el incendio de 1842. He lived in his own little house in Kingstras, a structure half brick and half wood, with a gable cut into steps, it looked upon one of those winding canals which intersect each other in the middle of the ancient quarter of Hamburg, and which a great fire of 1842 had fortunately spared. 163. Turk Cierto que la tal casa estaba un poco inclinada y amenazaba con su vientre a los transeuntes, que tenía el techo caído sobre la oreja, como las gorras de los estudiantes de Tugendun, que la verticalidad de sus líneas no era lo más perfecta, pero se mantenía firme gracias a un olmo secular y vigoroso en que se apoyaba la fachada, y que al cubrirse de hojas, llegada la primavera, la remozaba con un alegre verdor. It is true that the old house stood slightly off the perpendicular, and bulged out a little towards the street, its roof sloped a little to one side, like the cap over the left ear of a Chijunban student, its lines wanted accuracy, but after all, it stood firm, thanks to an old thumb which buttressed it in front, and which often in spring sent its young sprays through the window panes. Mi tío, para profesor alemán, no dejaba de ser rico. My uncle was tolerably well off for a German professor. La casa y cuanto encerraba eran de su propiedad. The house was his own, and everything in it. En ella compartíamos con él la vida su hija de Graven, una joven curlandesa de diecisiete años de edad, la criada Marta y yo, que, en mi doble calidad de huérfano y sobrino, le ayudaba a preparar sus experimentos. The living contents were his goddaughter Gruben, a young Verlandese of seventeen, Martha, and myself. As his nephew and an orphan, I became his laboratory assistant. Confieso que me dediqué con gran entusiasmo a las ciencias mineralógicas, 
por mis venas circulaba sangre de mineralogista y no me aburría jamás en compañía de mis valiosos pedruscos. I freely confess that I was exceedingly fond of geology and all its kindred sciences. The blood of a mineralogist was in my veins, and in the midst of my specimens I was always happy. En resumen, que vivía feliz en la casita de la Conillestrasse, a pesar del carácter impaciente de su propietario porque éste, independientemente de sus maneras brutales, me profesaba gran afecto. In a word, a man might live happily enough in the little old house in the Kingstrus, in spite of the restless impatience of its master, for although he was a little too excitable, he was very fond of me. Pero su gran impaciencia no le permitía aguardar, y trataba de caminar más a prisa que la misma naturaleza. But the man had no notion how to wait, nature herself was too slow for him. En abril, cuando plantaba en los potes de loza de su salón pies de reseda o de convólvulos, iba todas las mañanas a tirarles de las hojas para acelerar su crecimiento. In April, after he had planted in the terracotta pots outside his window seedling plants of mignonette and convolvulus, he would go and give them a little pull by their leaves to make them grow faster. Con tan original personaje, no tenía más remedio que obedecer ciegamente, y por eso acudía presuroso a su despacho, In dealing with such a strange individual there was nothing for it but prompt obedience. I therefore rushed after him. 